Hey NA Physics, it's Mr. Neff, and this is my video on mathematical description of a wave. Hey, this video's joke is, what did the sea monster say after he ate the ship? Watch till the end and I'll tell you. So I'm going to get into the mathematical description of a wave, but before I do, I want to talk just a little bit more about the transverse and longitudinal waves and how they are different based on their vibration. Now we know since they're waves, both transverse and longitudinal waves are transporting energy from one place to another. In both of these pictures, it's, they're transporting energy from the left side of the picture where that hand is doing the work to the right side of the picture. You can see though that it, in the transverse wave, the hand is doing work in the y direction. And the, that's going to make all the particles of the medium vibrate in the y direction. And so as I said on my last video, this particle is going to vibrate up and down like this. It's not going to make any progress towards the right, but it is going to vibrate up and down. And uh, it, that's its way to take on energy and give it to its neighbor. The wave speed, you can see that they're showing the wave speed with this little red arrow here. The wave speed is moving to the right. The wave speed is at a right angle to the vibration of the medium. And that's what makes this transverse. Over here with longitudinal, we have the hand vi vibrating forward, vibrating back. And that's going to make all of these particles vibrate forward, vibrate back in the same direction as the wave speed. And so since those are parallel, the vibration of the particles is parallel to the vibration of the medium, we are going to have a longitudinal wave. Now, our friends at Penn State did a great job in showing some vibration of some waves and I wanted to show you these uh, images that they did. Here you can see some longitudinal waves and you can see that these are longitudinal because the wave is moving to the right but the particles are moving left to right. They're vibrating in a parallel and anti-parallel direction to the wave speed. You can see that those particles are not making any progress. They have uh, marked a few of the particles in red, and those particles are vibrating back and forth, but they're not making any progress towards the right. As opposed to that with some transverse waves, now we've got some waves that are vibrating up and down. The particles are vibrating up and down, and the energy is moving to the right. So if I were going to compare these two, the transverse and longitudinal, I'd say that they're both ways for, to transport energy. And in both of these pictures, it's being transported to the right. But where they're very different is the longitudinal wave has the vibration parallel to the wave speed, and the transverse wave has it perpendicular to the wave speed. Uh, I hit upon this a little bit in my last video, but this is a, a, a great illustration of this where uh, you can see some water waves. Water waves are transverse and longitudinal at the same time. And so uh, the, when you couple transverse motion and longitudinal motion together, you're going to get these circular patterns. This is neat because you can see that the waves at the top, the particles at the top, are making pretty big circles. And as you go down into the water, the circles get smaller and smaller and smaller. And this is just kind of a neat thing to see. These are called Raleigh surface waves, and they are things that move through solids. And uh, here we have, at first glance, something that looks like the same thing we saw with the water wave. But if you saw the water wave, the two circles, even though they're different sizes, they are, they are still moving in the same direction. Both of those are going clockwise. Versus down here with the Raleigh wave, you can see that the that the circle at the top or the ellipse at the top is moving in a counterclockwise direction, whereas the one at the bottom is moving in a clockwise direction. Uh, that's what makes an earthquake very, very destructive because you're going to get the top of the, of the soil moving in one direction, whereas down into the soil a little bit uh, moving in the opposite direction. So that was a, that's a great illustration from our friends at Penn State. Now, along those lines, uh, is a pretty neat application of this. And we, we know that water is going to have a surface tension. And that's 
just a way to say that those cohesive forces between the particles at the surface of the water, well, they're going to make the particles want to stick together. And so if on this picture, if I took particle A and I got it to vibrate a little, maybe I throw a rock onto it, maybe I step on it, maybe the wind blows it. If I, if I push it down, uh, it's going to bring the particles side to side with it because they're connected with that surface tension. We know that surface tension is there. We've seen the old demonstration with the paper clip floating on the water, or we've all seen a water bug on the surface of, of the water. And so we know that those particles are attracted to each other. Well, because of this, if I gave A a shake, then that would bring its neighbors with it. Uh, that happens on the surface, but then at this, uh, down inside of the water, down in the water, we call it the bulk, B-U-L-K, of the water. And in the bulk of the water, we have particles all around. And so look at particle B. If I give particle B a shake, it wouldn't necessarily bring the particles side to side with it because there are all of these other particles up here, and there's just a showing a few. There are going to be tons of them. There are all these other particles to which B's neighbor is attracted. So will, will B's neighbor go with B if I push B down? Maybe a little bit, but not nearly as well as A's neighbors would have gone through it. All that is to say, transverse waves, they do travel very, very well across the surface of, of uh, a fluid. But down in the bulk, transverse waves don't do well. Longitudinal waves, on the other hand, they do great in any case because longitudinal waves rely on collisions and high pressure to, for propagation of the wave. And so if I take A and I, and I push it into its neighbor, well, its neighbor will not just stay there. It will be repelled. And the same thing would happen down here. If I took B and I pushed it into its neighbor, B would be repelled because of the higher pressure that I would have created. So all that is to say that, that longitudinal waves on the surface do well and longitudinal waves through the bulk do well. And so here's the difference. You see that the, if a wave is traveling through the bulk of a fluid, then we feel fairly confident that it is a longitudinal wave. And this is how we know that when we lo look at the Earth's layers, that the core of the Earth is going to be a liquid because we, we have reason to believe that, there, that transverse waves are not able to pass through. You might say, well, how would we know this? Well, when an earthquake happens, scientists talk about the waves that are formed as either P waves or S waves. P waves for primary waves, some people mistake this for pressure waves, although that's not the worst mistake ever because they are longitudinal waves. And you can see that the longitudinal or primary waves, well, they vibrate side to side while the wave is traveling side to side. The transverse wave, on the other hand, when, and science will call that an S wave or a secondary wave, I like to think of that S as uh, looking wave-like. If I took that S and I turned it on its side, well, it kind of gives you that transverse wave picture. Uh, you can see that those waves are vibrating at a right angle. Well, say an earthquake happens at the very top of the, of the Earth here, and so you'll see that in all directions, S waves and P waves will go out. You can, you can call around the world and you can say, hey, we just had an earthquake up here. What do you feel? And there will be a distinct area on the other side of the inner core, which, is, which we believe is liquid, that will not have any S waves. And because of that, we say, hey, the S waves aren't getting through. P waves are. That must mean there's liquid down there. And we can kind of, based on how big the zone of shadow is, for of the S waves, we can kind of work backwards and we can say, hey, the, the center, that, that uh, liquid outer core must be that big. Kind of a neat application of longitudinal and transverse waves. One last thing that I'll, I'll mention about, about waves themselves is uh, long ago, we used to think that all waves needed a medium. And so and that is that that substance for the wave to pass through. We used to think that every kind of wave needed that medium. And so people thought that space was full of uh, that medium. We thought that, hey, if the if from the sun to the earth, the wave is getting here, well, then this must be full of stuff. 
and, uh, and they even had a name for the stuff that was there, and it was called the luminiferous ether. And uh, ironically, it was later determined that that ether is, well, not there. And w all of a sudden, we said there really are two different kinds of waves in this manner, too. Uh, waves that need a medium to pass through, we call those mechanical waves, and those are most of the waves you can think of. But then there's also going to be this other kind of wave, this electromagnetic wave, that does not need a medium. More on that upcoming. Last thing I'm going to say about, about this, and this is actually the focus of the, of the video, is the, for the ma mathematical description of a wave. So whenever we talked weeks ago about the simple harmonic oscillator, we would say it vibrated in time. It would go over and back and over and back, and we would, say, we would ask questions about where was it as a function of time or how fast is it moving as a function of time. We said that the, where it was anyway was a cosine of omega t, and the omega, remember, was 2 times pi times the frequency and so forth. It made sense to only talk about, about uh, the position as a function of time because there was, uh, it wasn't going anywhere. It was just it was retracing its steps again and again and again. But now with the wave, it actually travels out. And so rather than me saying, what's the amplitude of the wave at some point, that doesn't make sense because if you can see on a wave between zero and the amplitude and the negative amplitude, it has all the different values. And so we're going to say, what is the displacement y at a time t and at a, at a certain location from the origin? Now, it's, it, this seems like it's going to be very complicated, but it actually is not. It's the same kinds of ideas that we had in the past, but rather than, than us just having our 2 pi ft or our omega t, we are going to have another term that involves distance, and that's going to be 2 pi x over the wavelength. It makes some sense which one goes with which because remember when you take a sign of something you can't have a unit on it and so the, we, the frequency goes along with the time because those two are going to have seconds and one over seconds to cancel and it, it makes sense that the wavelength couples with the meters. Also remember that when the wave's traveling to the right you are going to have a negative here, so it's the opposite maybe of what you would think. And if the wave's traveling to the left, then you have a positive here. How does this work exactly? Well, how about just one quick example before we go. Here we have a tra transverse wave traveling on a string, and the, and the displacement of the particle is given by this equation. And when you look at that equation, you say, aha, this thing that's right here after the equal sign must be the amplitude. This part right here that's with the sign, well the part that's with the t must be 2 times pi times the frequency, and this part that's by the x is, a, is the uh, 2 pi over the wavelength. And so they, uh, they tell you that, the, that this angle is in radians, which is good, that's a, that's a stipulation of this equation that you have to have the angle in radians, and they tell you the linear density of the string. Remember in our last video we called that mu. And they're asking for the tension in the string. Well, one thing I can do then is I can say, well, if 2 pi f is equal to 25, well, that means the frequency must be 12.5 over pi. You could simplify that, but you'll see that would be a waste in, uh, of time in a second here. And then I can say that 2, remember, the, the negative talks about the, the wave traveling to the right, so don't worry about the, the negative part, but the 2 is equal to um, 2 pi over the wavelength. And so that means the wavelength is pi. And if I put those two together, I see the wave speed is 12.5 meters per second. Now, if you can remember from the last video, we know that the wave speed on a string is equal to the square root of the tension divided by that linear mass density. So that means that the linear mass density times the speed squared is equal to the tension. And if you just go ahead and plug those things in, you will see that you end up with a tension of 2.5 newtons. Hey, Ann, what did the sea serpent say when it ate the ship? 
I can't believe I ate the whole thing.